to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ trust in the lord with all your heart lean not on your own understanding proverbs chapter 3 verse number 5. we welcome you today to our topical study of the book of proverbs we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast and as always we want you to know that today's lessons are brought to you by members of the Church of Christ in your area. Those members of the Lord's Church would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. You've got a Bible question, you'd like to know more about the church or, or have a Bible study. They'd be happy to sit down and discuss the scriptures with you. And as always at the Gospel of Christ, we want to encourage you to visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a host of free Bible study materials. We have DVD lessons, audio lessons, uh, written material, as well as transcripts that you can read or study. And all of that is available to you free of charge at thegospelofchrist.com. And friend, we encourage you to check out the Church of Christ in your area. You'll find people there who love the Lord and love the truth. As we think today about the book of Proverbs, what a wonderful, practical book this is from the Word of God. Many have said that the book of Proverbs is like the James of the New Testament. It's all about practical living, practical godly living for everyday life. And in this series of lessons, we're going to think about the, some of the topical lessons that you find in the book of Proverbs. Unlike, say, the book of Romans or Hebrews, where you might read through it in a paragraphical thought format, Proverbs is more of a topical study in which each verse almost stands on its own dealing with a topic itself. And so we begin today in our series of lessons by thinking about what the book of Proverbs has to say about sin and its consequences. And like much of the Bible, most of the Bible, the, the Word of God tells us that sin is destructive, but hope is also given for dealing with the sin problem. One of the lessons that we learn from the outset of Proverbs is that no matter how fast you can run, you cannot outrun sin. Sin will always find you out. I want you to notice what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. Notice Proverbs chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. The scripture says this, His own iniquities entrap the wicked man, and he is caught in the cords of his sin. He shall die for lack of instruction, and in the greatness of his folly he shall go astray. Notice those words again. This man's iniquities, another word for sin, entrap him. He's caught in the cords of sin. It's though, as though this man has been involved in a life of sin, and it has tangled him up, and it has entrapped him. Friend, you can never outrun sin. There are a lot of people who may live their life with sin in it, and a lot of people who may think they've gotten away with it. But you can never escape the consequences of sin. I'm reminded of a couple of examples of this in the Scripture. In Numbers chapter 32, verse number 23, the Bible clearly teaches us, be sure your sins will find you out. You're not going to escape the consequences of it. It's eventually going to have its day of reckoning. And maybe an example of that from the New Testament might help us as well. Do you remember a pretty famous couple in the book of Acts, by the name of Ananias and Sapphira. Acts chapter 5, we learn about this couple and some of the things that are involved in their life. We know that at this point in time in the history of the early church, certain people were selling things and bringing those uh, at the apostles' feet, and they were used for the greater good of spreading the gospel and for teaching the lost. And so a couple by the name of Ananias and Sapphira, they have land, they sold it, and they gave a portion of it to the work of the church. 
Now, there was nothing wrong with them selling their land, nothing wrong with giving some of it to the church and necessarily keeping some of it for themselves. But the problem is that they lied to God and they lied to the Holy Spirit and they basically said, we're giving all of the proceeds to the church. When in essence, they didn't. And so they're both questioned about this. They both lied to the apostles. And as a result, because of their lying, because they tried to sin and hide that, they both suffered deadly consequences because of that. They thought they could get away with it. They tried to lie to God. They thought nobody will ever, we'll be the only ones who know, nobody else will ever know. And yet they both suffered horrible consequences because of that. Think about another famous person in the Old Testament, King David. King David had ungodly, immoral relations with Bathsheba. He tried to hide that in multiple ways. He tried to lie about it. He had Bathsheba's uh, husband killed. He tried to make him think it was his child when he found out she was with child. And, and just a set of lies begins to occur at, uh, at the hand of David trying to hide that sin. Well, David eventually got found out. When Nathan came to him and told that story and, and David realized, I am the man. And there were consequences that came because of that. Friend, here's the practical application as we think about living messages from the book of Proverbs today. Let's realize that God knows what's going on in my life and yours. The Bible says in Acts 1 verse 24, God knows what's in our heart. John 2 verse 25, Jesus knows what's within man. I am not, here, listen to Hebrews 4.13. All things are open and naked before the eyes of Him with whom we must give an account. Let's not think to ourselves that we can hide sin or immorality or ungodliness from God. God knows all. God sees all. And, and friend, that doesn't have to be a negative thing. Isn't it wonderful to know that God does know and see all things? But let's also realize, no matter how private it may be, no matter who we think we've tricked, you're not going to fool God there will be a day of reckoning for all sin. Remember these words from the book of Proverbs about the man who thinks he's hiding his sin. His own iniquities entrap the wicked man and he is caught in the cords of sin. A second practical lesson that we learn about sin from the book of Proverbs is that not only does our sin entrap us and that you can't run from it and hide from it, but the Bible teaches that sin is actually damaging to the individual. Listen to Proverbs chapter 8. I want you to take your Bible and notice what it says in Proverbs chapter 8, verse number 36. The Word of God says, But he who sins against me, listen to this, He who sins against me wrongs his own soul. All those who hate me love death. You know, I don't, I don't think sometimes we really understand the damaging effects of sin. You know, the world looks at sin as sometimes a, a descriptive term for something really good. We might say of a, a dessert or something that tastes good, it's so good it's sinful. Friend, I don't think we've really got the idea of what sin is and how damaging it is to the individual. When I sin, I'm at the very least searing my conscience. 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 6, and the ultimate result of that, if I do not repent, will be eternal destruction. And so sin is not just something to be flirted with or just a, a good idea to think about. It does great damage to the individual. Listen to these passages that help us to understand the nature of sin. The Bible says this in Ezekiel 18, 4, The soul who sins will surely die. Now friend, if I told you today, if you do that, if you drink that, if you eat that, if you, you get involved in that, you're going to die. Why, people would run from that like the plague. And yet, that's what sin brings. It may not be immediate, and it's not physical, tangible, touchable, so we don't always see it up front, but realize that, that sin is damaging to the individual soul because it ultimately brings spiritual death. Think about the words of God in Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, The Lord's ear is not heavy, that He cannot hear. His arms not shortened, that He cannot save. But your sins and your iniquities have separated you from your God. 
What does sin do? Not only does it bring death, it brings separation from God. And friend, do we understand that? What does it mean to be separated from God? God is good. James 1 verse 17. God is the source of, uh, of all love. 1 John 4 verse 8. He brings hope. He brings joy. He brings comfort to my life. God is light and happiness. Would anybody want to be separated from those things? And yet, that's the damage sin does to my soul and to yours. And ultimately, as Paul said, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in Romans 6 23, the wages of sin is death. Friend, God doesn't want it. We don't want that. Nobody wants that. But let's realize the truth behind the matter. Sin damages one's soul because ultimately, if people live in sin and die in sin, they're going to live eternally in that horrible place called hell. And God wants all men to be saved and thus the, the encouragement today is realize the damage that sin can do to one's soul. But friend, let's also realize this about sin and I think sometimes this gets overlooked especially as people begin to talk about uh, sin and maybe even other people's sin. The book of Proverbs teaches us that sin that has been dealt with in a God-approved way, that sin needs to be laid to rest and not resurrected again. We need to let it, let it lie, as it were, when sin's been dealt with. Listen to Proverbs 10. Take your Bible and look along in Proverbs chapter 10. I want you to notice what the Word of God's going to say in verse number 12. The Scripture says, Hatred stirs up strife. Now notice this, but love covers all sins. Now, love is not covering it in the sense that it's covering and it not to be dealt with. That's not, not the idea. But, but sin that's been dealt with by a, a, someone who's trying to follow God, sin that's been repented of, sin that's in the past. Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forward to the things which are ahead. Love covers that sin. It doesn't open it up. It doesn't put it out there on a pedestal. It doesn't put it on Facebook or things like that for everybody to see and know about. No, if we're going to say what the Bible says about sin, sin that's been dealt with needs to be laid to rest, not to be resurrected again. You know, that's what love is all about, isn't it? Listen to 1 Corinthians 13, verse 6. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but it rejoices in the truth. If I know that somebody has had a sin problem in their life, you can think of somebody who may have had an addiction, may have been in an immoral situation, and they have turned their life around. What good is it going to do to bring that person's past up? Do I really love them? If I'm bringing all that dirt up again, or if I'm gossiping or using that for slander or things like unto that? Friend, Proverbs teaches us sin that's been dealt with, it does need to be left alone. Think about Paul, Philippians 3, verses 10 through 12. Paul clearly said, you can't live in the past. Forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forward to those things which are ahead. If God, if the Bible says in Hebrews 8, 13, and it does, God says, I'll be merciful of their sins, their lawless deeds, I'll remember no more. If God forgives and forgets, and Proverbs says, love covers sin. You don't need to go around talking about somebody's past or bringing up things that are only going to be hurtful to them. In the book of Proverbs, we also learn this. Sin is not something that you can laugh at, not something you can joke about. It's not a laughing matter in the Bible. I want you to notice what the Word of God says in Proverbs chapter 14, verse number 9. L listen to this vivid language. Fools, who? Fools mock. What's that word mock mean? They, they make fun of, they laugh, they joke about, they think it's no big deal. Fools mock at sin, but among the upright there is favor. Friend, I don't know how to say it, but to say it as plainly as we can. You're a fool if you think you can make sin the laughing stock. You're a fool if you think you're going to get the last joke in on sin. And a lot of people do want to make just a, a, a big joke about sin. We hear people, we see it regularly, people that you know, talk about immorality, uh, adultery, fornication, homosexuality, all those problems. People talk about immorality as though it's the next best thing. And it's just really cool and fun to be a part of. Hey, if you think that's right, let me tell you something. The Bible says that's foolish. How's it going to feel when families are broken? 
How are you going to feel when you're left there hurting and, and, and not having the relationship that you wanted to have? Those things are not going to bring happiness and joy and peace to your life. Sometimes we hear people talk about uh, substance abuse as though that is really something cool. Drunkenness, uh, drug use, smoking marijuana, uh, things like that. And, and to hear people talk about it, wow, that's just the greatest thing ever. Well, they didn't talk about the fellow laying in the ditch in his own vomit, did they? They didn't, they didn't talk about the family that's broken up because of meth or marijuana or somebody who's got an addiction and they can't pay their bills and they're late on two or three mortgages and they're about to be kicked out. Oh, it sounds real fun and you can act like it's a big joke. But seeing it's foolish. The Bible clearly teaches, friend, that it is foolish to mock at sin. Let me say it this way. You won't get the last laugh when it comes to sin. Sin will always get the last laugh. Now, there is a cure. There is a way to deal with it. Thank God for Jesus Christ who can forgive sin. But you've got to look at it the way God looks at it, that it's not a, a laughing matter. Then in the book of Proverbs, let's realize how a Christian should look at sin. I shouldn't joke about it. It's not a laughing matter. It's serious because it does great damage to one's soul. But let's then take a God-approved way of looking at sin. Friend, the Bible teaches sin ought to be shameful to the child of God. Proverbs chapter 14, verse number 34. Here's what the Word of God says. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. What's that word reproach mean? It's, it's detestable. It's, a, it's something that's shameful. It's something that we ought to, uh, ought to be ashamed of and think of in bad light. It's kind of the idea. Righteousness, that's going to exalt a nation. Sin, that drags a nation down. And Christians ought to view that with shame. One of the dark times, really, really dark times in Israel's history was when they got to a point where sin was no longer a reproach. In the book of Jeremiah, uh, Israel is headed on a fast track to destruction. They have been flirting with the nations around them. They've been worshiping the pagans and, and all the idols around them. And God's had enough. He's tried to help them. He's reached out to them in love. He's done everything possible. But Israel has got hard-hearted and calloused to God. The Bible says in Jeremiah 8 verse 12 that it had reached a low point when they could no longer blush over sin. I wonder sometimes, have we become desensitized to sin? We see so much uh, sin, as it were, on, on many media outlets. You know, it's almost as living together is commonplace. Immorality, things that are uh, against God and the teaching of the Bible, we see those so regularly that it's almost as it's second nature and we've become desensitized to that problem. Friend, a Christian ought to be ashamed of sin. Paul discusses with the church in Corinth the man who is caught in adultery, the man who has his father's wife, the man who ought to be disfellowshipped. And Paul says, in essence, the things you ought to be ashamed of, you're no longer ashamed of. Friend, we ought to be able to blush. It ought to break our heart. It ought to embarrass Christians to see sin. Let's never get to the point where sin is just something that is second nature. It's got to be against God, against His will, and that which ultimately is going to cause people to suffer eternal destruction. But friend, as we think about the matter of sin, and as we think about sin in general from the book of Proverbs, let's hear what God says also about the sin problem as it relates to its cure. First, Let's realize the book of Proverbs so vividly and clearly expresses I don't have and you don't have. Man doesn't have the answer to deal with the sin problem. I want you to notice what the Word of God says in Proverbs chapter 20. Take your Bible in the Old Testament and look with me in Proverbs chapter 20, verse number 9. The Word of God says this, Who can say, I have made my heart clean. I am pure from my sin. Who can say that? Well, the answer is rhetorical. Nobody can say, I've made my heart clean. I am pure from my own sin. What's the point? Man can't deal with 
his sin problem. Do you remember uh, Jeremiah 10 verse 23? Jeremiah said, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man who walks to direct his own steps. And then think about these words. Proverbs 14, 12. Proverbs chapter 16, verse number 25. There is a way that seems right to a man. Well, what about that way man thinks is right? But the end thereof is the way of death. Friend, there's a lot of people today who will tell you. We just want to be honest and plain from the Scriptures. There's a lot of people who will tell you, you can deal with sin this way. Or this is what you need to do to be right with God. Or if, if you make a donation to this, or if you pray this prayer, or you do all this, your sin will be okay. Friend, all I want to know is, is there any word from the Lord? Jeremiah 37, 17. What does the Scripture say? How does God want us to deal with sin? Now, we mentioned several ideas related to man being incapable to deal with his own sin, but let me flip that coin over. And I want to show you a man who had the perfect attitude. He was hard-hearted. He was caught up in religious error. He was as calloused as you could imagine in some ways. And yet his heart was broken and he had the right attitude. This man is traveling down the road in Acts chapter 9. Jesus confronts him. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And listen to these words. Lord, what would you have me to do? There's the right attitude. The attitude is not, hey, I don't have any sin. I can take care of that myself. It'll be all right. Well, no. Paul said, Lord, what do you want me to do? I know I can't deal with my own sin problem. I know sin is a burden too heavy to bear. I need to let God help me with that. And that's the, the great attitude that Saul of Tarsus had. But friend, I want to emphasize why it's so important, so important that we let God help us with the sin problem. And here's that reason. The book of Proverbs clearly teaches that if you continue sowing sin, you continue being involved in sin, you're going to reap the consequences of that sin. Listen to Proverbs. Take your Bible, and I want you to notice what Proverbs chapter 22, verse number 8 says. Notice these words. He who sows iniquity will reap sorrow, and the rod of his anger will fall. Friend, you can't, one preacher put it this way, and I think it's rather vivid. You can't sow sin and pray for a crop failure. It's just not going to work that way. You can't live a life of sin. You can't keep doing things that are immoral and ungodly. You can't uh, look lightly at sin and hope one day that it doesn't come time to pay that debt. Realize this, if I reap sin, if I live in sin, and if I remain in sin, if I die in sin, there are going to be awful consequences to that. God doesn't want that. We don't want that. But it's a reality. The Bible says this in Hebrews 9, 27. It's appointed a man once to die, and then the judgment. At the judgment, each of us shall give an account for the things done in the body, whether good or evil. 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 10. To those who have done good, We'll hear those wonderful words from Matthew 25. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of your Lord. But to those who reap sin, the Bible says, Jesus will say to them, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The words of Proverbs 22 verse 8 remind me so vividly of what Paul said in Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8. The Apostle Paul said this, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. But friend, as we bring this idea about sin and its consequences in the book of Proverbs full circle and to a close, we want to end on this last note, and it's a wonderful note. There is a proper way to deal with the sin problem. If you're following along in the book of Proverbs, I want you to look in your Bible in Proverbs chapter 28, verse number 13. Listen to these beautiful words. He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will 
will have mercy. There is mercy to be found if we're willing to deal with sin the way God tells us to. Proverbs 16, 6 says this, In mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity, and by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. Now we realize that the book of Proverbs is addressing a crowd mainly in the Old Testament error. Its messages are vivid and practical for us. But even there we see hints at the answer to the sin problem. And friend, that answer today is so vivid and beautifully exemplified in the words of Jesus. Matthew chapter 1, as the angel is speaking to the parents of Jesus, he says, you will call his name Jesus. Why? He will save his people from their sins. And as Jesus, in, that, in those final hours with his disciples, instituted the Lord's Supper, he took that, that fruit of the vine and he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Yes, there is a, a proper way to deal with the sin problem. Jesus is the way. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by Him, John 14, 6. And, and friend, we want to encourage you today. I want you to see there's an answer to this. Maybe you've got sin in your life. Maybe there are things you're struggling with and that you need and want God's help. Friend, we want you to know help is here. Help can be provided. It's found in Jesus Christ. We ask you today, do you believe Jesus is the Savior of the world? Jesus said, unless you believe I'm He, you'll surely die in your sins, John 8, 24. Do you believe it enough that you would change your life Turn from sin and to God in repentance, Acts 3, verse 19. Would you confess, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. And friend, to have, to have every sin washed away, would you be immersed in water? Peter told those on Pentecost, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins, Acts 2, verse 38. Friend, at the gospel of Christ, if we can help you in any way, don't hesitate to contact us, call us, email us, write to us. The only thing we're concerned about is men and women going to heaven. We thank you for joining us today and encourage you to join our next broadcast as we look at the unsearchable riches of Christ. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.